The Fed has other tools to impact monetary policy, although some of those are less often used in the U.S. The Fed, or any central bank, can change the reserve requirement. It's a drastic change. The U.S. Fed rarely conducts monetary policy these days with that tool, but other central banks might use it. A higher reserve ratio means banks must keep more reserves for any given level of deposits. So therefore, there'll be fewer loans, less money, smaller money multiplier. Because remember, the money multiplier is 1 over RR. For example, in the T-table, I've supposed a 6% reserve ratio, up from 5%, so the bank has got to come up with a million more reserves. It's going to have a million less loans. Those reserves are going to be locked up. Bank system is not going to have excess reserves. Now, if the central bank were worried, they could do open market operations to smooth the transition. If banks need to hold more in reserves, then the central bank could provide more reserves as it buys more bonds in open market operations. Oppositely, if the central bank were to lower the reserve requirement, then that would mean banks could make more loans, create more money. In the U.S., the Fed has a 0% required reserve ratio on the first few million dollars of deposits, then 3%, then 10% as the banks get bigger. Another monetary policy tool is changing the discount rate. If the bank just has a shortage of reserves, usually they'd borrow from other banks. The interest rate that banks pay each other to borrow reserves is known as the Fed Funds Rate, and the Fed pays close attention to that. Usually they want to make it easy for banks to fix a temporary shortage. But banks could also borrow directly from the Fed, which, remember, has all the money in the world. Now, banks prefer to borrow from each other, since if they borrow from the Fed, then that could provoke some questions from the regulators. It's not commonly used these days, but those additional reserves would be borrowed from the discount window. The bank would have to put up some collateral at a discount. Loans of the value of 100 might be only worth 96 or 97 per 100, thus the discount. That's part of how the central bank provides a backstop to the financial system. Banks can get reserves from the Fed. Monetary policy tool number four is quantitative easing. This is relatively new in the U.S. since 2007-2008 financial crisis. Central bankers being a conservative bunch of people, so even though it's been used in the U.S. for 15 years, even longer in Japan, it's still new. Quantitative easing is the Fed buying bonds, a whole lot of different kinds of bonds, not necessarily only government bonds, to put reserves in the bank system. The Fed also pays interest on reserves. Ordinarily, that might lower the Fed funds rate, but the Fed funds rate has a lower bound. It really cannot go much below zero. So it's a way of increasing the quantity of reserves even as the price goes to zero. These days, the Fed pays interest on reserve can change that interest rate. Other interest rate changes depend on that, where a cheap rate or a low rate makes borrowing easy, while an expensive rate makes borrowing more difficult. For a lot of people, that means mortgage rates to buy a home. There are a lot of different interest rates. It can be confusing. I sympathize. The Fed funds rate is the rate banks pay to borrow reserve, and there are both spot and futures contracts, meaning that a bank can write a contract that depends on the current spot interest rate, or could write a contract saying that in six months, it would want to borrow for three months ahead of that. Banks can write a contract now specifying the interest rate that it will pay between six and nine months ahead. It sounds complicated. But these are giant, highly sophisticated financial actors. They can handle it. Another interest rate that used to be common is LIBOR. That's now being deprecated, and instead banks use SOFR, S-O-F-R, Secured Overnight Financing Rate. That is overnight borrowing with treasuries and bonds as collateral. These are often repos. The main difference between SOFR and LIBOR is that SOFR is based on actual transactions. One of the problems with LIBOR was it was a survey. Somebody would call up a bank and say, suppose you needed to lend, maybe you don't actually, but suppose you did, how much would you pay? Banks were not always truthful. Surprise! Surprise! 
Banks are not paragons of truth and honesty. It's better to look at what they actually pay, not what they say they might pay. There are lots of different interest rates, even within the U.S. federal government. They borrow for different time horizons. If they borrow for one month or 30 years, they pay different rates. That's the yield curve, as we discussed earlier. There are other federal agencies, such as Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, quasi-governmental organizations. Different corporations have different interest rates. Just like ordinary people have a credit score, corporate issues get a rating. They're rated by three principal agencies, Moody's, S&P, and Fitch. The top rate is AAA. Sometimes the capitalization is different, sometimes AA1 or a plus. There are a lot of different notches to these ratings. Lower down, they could be BAA1 or BBB+. Those are still investment grade. Lower down are non-investment grade, sometimes called high yield bonds, sometimes called junk bonds. If you're a really well-known corporation with a lot of money in the bank, you can borrow cheap. If you're a little sketchy, then you're gonna pay a higher rate. Then there are different mortgage rates. For example, the prime rate, which is the rate the bank will charge to prime customers, while others might pay more. There are other consumer rates for auto loans, personal loans, student loans, etc. We can think of a whole surface of bond prices or interest rates, depending on maturity and depending on the risk. Monetary policy will change some fundamental interest rate, and those changes percolate to the other interest rates in the economy. There are changes to the cost of borrowing for firms and for consumers. As the cost of borrowing rises, they're going to borrow less, or vice versa if the cost of borrowing were to fall. Some sectors are more sensitive to borrowing costs. Housing is super sensitive. Construction industries feel the change in the Fed's monetary policies first. In corporate finance, firms decide on investment projects depending on whether they pass some hurdle rate, which is determined by the cost of funds. All of this from the perspective of our aggregate expenditure models, which recall is that aggregate expenditure equals C plus I plus G plus X minus M. All of this means changes in interest rates are going to directly affect I, investments. Later on, especially in subsequent classes, you might complicate equations. Maybe I equals I naught plus FR, where R is the interest rate and F is some parameter. But for us, for now, we just want to understand that lower interest rates are going to shift the AD, aggregate demand, curve outwards, whereas high interest rates are going to shift the aggregate demand curve inward. Those changes will shift both the level of output and the level of prices in ratio depending on the slope of the aggregate supply. Now, how does the Fed choose rates? They have a dual mandate. They're supposed to pursue high em employment and low inflation, but generally can't have both of those. We'll talk about that trade-off, or we did talk about the trade-off in the Phillips curve. Sometimes economists discuss the Taylor rule, which, narrative voice, is not really a rule. Rather, it's an observation that you can get a pretty decent model of the Fed funds rate as just a linear function of the output gap, how far GDP is from potential, and the inflation rate. Recall that the output gap is related to the unemployment rate. So the Taylor rule, not a rule, just gives a baseline. One of the problems the Fed had after the financial crisis in 2008, though, was that the rule implied interest rates less than zero. That's kind of tough to do. The Fed usually tries to avoid surprises. It tries to signal ahead what it's going to do through what's called forward guidance. Sometimes they note what new information would change their choice. They might say, we're currently holding rates steady, but if blank happens, then we could raise rates. That kind of if-then statement is designed to help with predictability, although it's also sensitive to news. That predictability is in contrast to the old days of Fed policy. Alan Greenspan, who was chair from 1987 to 2006, would testify to Congress with lines like, I know you think you understand what you thought I said, but I'm not sure you realize that what you heard is not what I meant. 
I had to write that down so you can try to follow that chain of logic. Or other things, if I seem unduly clear to you, you must have misunderstood what I said. Maybe that's triggering. If you've had classes like that, I'm sorry. But nowadays, the Fed tries to communicate more clearly and not keep people guessing quite as much. In the US, monetary policy is designed to be pretty insulated from politics. Policy is chosen by this autonomous agency, the Fed. In Europe, the European Central Bank was set up to be independent from politics. The Bank of England was made autonomous a few decades ago. The Bank of Japan has quite a lot of autonomy. Politicians sometimes don't like that. They want more influence. Some countries have a central bank that might report directly to the president or prime minister. There, the worry would be there would be a political business cycle. Politicians want a good economy right around election time and postpone any complications till after the election is done. But whether the central bank is directly accountable to politicians or not, they still have an issue with figuring out how long it takes for their actions to have an effect on the economy. When the central bank changes interest rates today, it might take something like 9 to 18 months to have an effect. Milton Friedman, a well-known economist, worried that monetary policy could be like a fool in the shower. Water's too hot, so they crank the knob to get some colder. Then it turns freezing cold, so they crank the knob to go hot and get scalding hot water, crank knob cold, etc. We've all done this in the morning, depending on your level of mental activity. The Fed tries to make little tiny adjustments, not giant changes. They worry about market confidence, about future Fed choices, their own reputation. They may be doing things to establish that down the road, they'll continue to do the right thing. There are lots of complications and issues. I'll leave it as open question of how should the central bank respond to bubbles, asset prices, whether those are stock market bubbles or house prices. There are a lot of complications and open questions.